He's the inventor of the scratch. He's a teacher. DJ for the Fantastic Five. He's the legendary uh, Grammy Wizard Theater. Thank you so much for joining me on the live road tonight. Uh, no problem. No problem. Glad to be here. Glad yeah. to be here. Thanks. It's a true honor to uh, to have you in our studio. Um, sure. Let's start from the beginning. Um, I'm sure there's... What was your first taste, I guess, of rap music? And then what was your first taste of hip-hop culture? And I know you were there pretty much from the beginning, but like... When when did you know that? All right, this is what, this is what this is the music I want to be a part of, and this is the culture I want to be a part of. Well, I mean, it was definitely the early seventies um, when um, I realized what the what the hip hop culture was, you know, what a jam was. Um, this culture has been here for a long time. Um, I didn't realize what it was until I seen the two turntables <laughs> and the mixer that uh that grandmaster flash and my brother mean gene had you know because this culture was always around me you know with the graffiti in the streets with the with the b-boys with the uh the doo-wop people freestyling on the corner the way people you know the way people dress the way people walk the way people talk and stuff like that all that was always around me i just didn't know what it was mm -hmm. until i seen the two turntables in the mixer that's when it finally hit me that that I was born into a culture that was already here, you know? Was it ever, I mean, you know, we talk about culture, we talk about hip-hop culture, but mm -hmm. uh, I don't think everyone, I think people just, especially now, use it just as a kind of a just part, of, part of their slang, part of right, their right, right. Uh, Was hip-hop culture then, at that time, was it, was it, was it, what was it, how was it explained to you? Uh, like, how, well, when you were asked, what am I a part of? Was that ever a question that was asked? And then um, it was never a question of what I was a part of. I knew what I was a part of because I was living it every single day. Um, um, you know, just getting up in the morning, um, seeing the MCs freestyling and writing down rhymes and, and seeing my brother uh, playing music, playing beats and stuff like that and, and playing two turntables and a mixer. Um, b-boying and stuff like that um throwing house parties and and, and b-boying and up rocking and stuff like that um going out in the streets and and seeing a graffiti artist painting the trains and painting the sidewalks and and painting inside the buildings and stuff like that and you know listening to um um, um funk and soul music and and watching soul train and stuff like that Right there, I knew that I was a, a part of something. Nobody really had to explain it to me because I was actually living it, you know? <clears throat> what drew you to so what, what, what drew you to be the DJ uh, versus the graph writer versus the MC <laughs> versus the break, the break dancer? Well, well, first, I was a B-boy, you know, um, because I was... Um, you know, listening to the music, listening to my brother Mean Gene play music, him and Grandmaster Flash, and my way of 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 of, of enjoying myself and enjoying the music was was b boying. That was a way for me to um just uh, get out all this energy I had <laughs> inside me and stuff like that. And um, I remember when I actually sprained sprained my wrist. My wrist was uh was sprained, and I had a um, a cask on and, and and when i had the cask on i i finally realized that <laughs> i didn't want to be a b-boy anymore and um i got the opportunity to be a dj and once i got the the taste of being a dj that's when i finally decided that that's what i want to do you know <clears throat> who i guess so did dj come natural to you i mean was there what was the learning process for you oh yeah actually it came natural because um my mother um, had a, a record player in the house that looked like a coffin. You got the TV in the front, and if you lift it, if you lift up the coffin and look inside, she had a turntable, she had an eight-track deck, she had the the uh, the turntable there, she had the uh, the radio there, and I used to play the 45s on her um, on her turntable. And when the uh, the break. Which is the which is the best part of the record? It could be at the beginning, it could be in the middle, or it could be at the end. I would take the needle and skip the needle back to the break part, so I can you know enjoy the record a little bit more, 
and that's when I first got a taste of of actually uh, 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 wanting to DJ. Mm. And that's when I actually created the Needle Drop. Uh, actually, I, <laughs> the question I was going to ask know? you about uh, yeah. what is the Needle Drop? What is, uh, if you briefly, sorry, briefly explain what it is, but also what is that? What is the significance of the Needle Drop to the DJ, but then also to hip hop culture? Yeah, well, the Needle Drop is like, um, you know. A lot of a lot of uh, uh, people that listen to music actually started off with one turntable, so you would get to the break part of the record, which is the get down part, which is the drummer part, is which is the best part of the record. It might be at the beginning, it might be in the middle, or it might be at the end. And when you get to that break part, you want to pick the needle up and bring it back to the break part after it ends. And me, not knowing that. I was picking the needle up and, and pulling it back to the break part. I didn't know that I was developing the the needle drop style, <laughs> which is really, really crazy, you know? <laughs> and that's when, you know, I finally realized, man, that, you know, this might be my calling. This is, you know, DJing might be, you know, my calling. And then once I got on the turntables, everything came natural to me, you know? You talk about your brother, Mean Gene. You talk yes. about DJ, uh, DJ um, uh, sorry, Grandmaster Flash. Right. Um, at, what 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 has been their role in your life as a DJ? But also, what, what kind of what, what were the most important lessons you kind of took away from them? Um, the important lessons I took away from them is basically just like the uh, the all around genre of music that they play. I mean, they play disco music, they play funk and soul, they played breaks, they played the. Uh, the old slow jams, like the moments, the Delphonics, the stylistics and stuff like that, all the love songs. And um, I learned that, you know, you just can't just um, limit yourself to just one genre of music. You have to be open-minded to play all genres of music. Um, I learned um, that, you know, two turntables and a mixer, you know, to keep the, keep the party going. I learned about um, hooking up your speakers and stuff like that and... Just marketing yourself with uh, with mixtapes and stuff like that, and marketing yourself with uh, um, just coming out in the summertime and and doing block parties and stuff like that, so people can see you know your equipment, see the potential that you have. So when the winter time comes and it gets cold, and you start handing out flyers to the venues, people will actually come and pay the dollar, dollar fifty three dollars to see you play because they seen you play in the parks all summer, you know? Mm. So I've, I've, I've learned all that from, from, from my brother, Mean Gene and Grandmaster Flash. Yeah. There's a f- few questions that I might, I might be all over the place, but from, so even from that statement, a um, couple of things, you, 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 you're talking about the significance of the importance of having different, obviously different genres of music. Absolutely. Um, because at the time rap was not, it was not on, you know, wasn't on the radio. wasn't wasn't the number one genre of music now. So you right, have right. A, you have a generation of kids growing up where rap is their their influence. Mm-hmm. Um, how significant is for a DJ? Is it to not just have not not have to have more than just rap in his or her record collection? Uh, to be more, you know, to to have more knowledge about like you said, the stylistics or even like the rock band Kiss, you know, all these, you know, what what's the importance there for a DJ coming up today? Well, the importance is if, you, if you're going to call yourself a DJ, you can't just limit yourself to just R&B and, 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 and funk and soul music. You have to, you have to keep an open mind to open genre music. You know, my mom's played Aretha Franklin. She played Al Green. She played, um, she played Barry White. She played Tom Jones. She played, um, um, she played so many different groups, man. You know, not just African American groups. She played rock music. You know, she played yeah. jazz. She played all types of music. And once I started DJing, I realized that that's the type of music you want to play. I mean, if you're a DJ and you only play hip hop music, that means that people are gonna only call you to do hip hop parties, right? You know, you want to be able to do an 80s party and play some 80s songs. You want to be able to uh, 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 do a party and play some rock music or some soft rock music. 
or some um, funk and soul music and stuff like that, you wouldn't be able to play all this music. Then you, you'll be able to get more work and you'll be able to broaden your mind and the different music that's coming from other different places other than United States. You got, you got groups from Australia. You got groups from China. You got groups from Japan. And we were actually playing all these groups, yeah. you know? I mean, we were playing Phil Collins. We were playing, um, um, we were playing Aerosmith. We were playing Kiss, you know? We were playing all these groups, man. And and to be a DJ, you got to have to, you know, broaden your horizons and play all different genres of music. You talked about, you also uh, talked about marketing yourself, mm-hmm. um, you know, making sure that when time winter comes, you're, people know who you are. <laughs> Absolutely. What? Okay, I, when you say marketing yourself now, right? Um, you got this. It's like marketing yourself to a label, you know, like mm-hmm. trying to be all right. I want to. I'm going to hand out my, my my demo to whoever and hopefully get signed. You're right. obviously marketing yourself for a different reason mm-hmm. uh, at this time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, a couple. So, did were you? Did you see what was happening with the culture as something that was going to be this like huge? Obviously billion dollar industry now or did you more see it as like a local you know it's just gonna be a local thing that you know uh, 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 like you know a local guy that i could just make money off of that parties or something like that did you envision that it was gonna be what it is today absolutely not i didn't envision what it was going to be like today um we did what we did because of the love mm. you know um we were we were around uh, abandoned buildings, buildings being set on fire, gangs, single parent homes, um, um, people not being able to get jobs, um, the government not putting money back into the community, and hip hop was our way of getting away from the everyday, um, um you know, getting away from the everyday hustles and bustles that, that were, that was like bringing us down, you know? I mean, you got the MC will sit down and write about stuff. It may be, you know, it may be drugs or going to school or his girlfriend or stuff like that. And then you got the graffiti artist that's painting in colors and, and frustrated about life, you know? And then you got the, the, the DJ that may just go in his room and just start playing music and just take his mind, you know, out of what's going on in the streets and stuff like that. And that's what we did. We wasn't worried about if we was going to make any money off of it. We just got to the point where we had expenses where are we going to, are we going to buy two turntables and a mixer and buy all these records and stuff like that. We need to start charging people (laughs) a little bit of money so that we can have some money to go out and, and, and purchase some 45s purchase some albums, purchase some speakers, purchase some turntables, and purchase some mixers so that we can continue to keep doing what we're doing, you know? Mm. We didn't know that this art form, this culture, was going to be, you know, what it is today. This question I should have asked you in the beginning, and I know you've know you definitely answered this, but I'm always, Grand Wizard Theater, how did that name come to be? And were there other names that you kind of tried out that you might not, you know, might not remember or want to talk about, but be prior to settling on. How well, we I never really, um, um, when I first started DJing, I just went straight for it. You know, DJ Theodore, you know, I just kept it real. That, that's my name and that's going to be my DJ name. I didn't really think about, you know, um, um, trying to, you know, glorify my name or anything. I just went for, you know, DJ Theodore. And as time went by, my MCs, fantastic. They said like the way you play the music and way and the way the way you play the music and the way you electrify the crowd, you know, you 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 play music different from everybody else. It's like uh, you're magical on a turntable, so we're going to call you Grand Wizard. You know, that's how Grand Wizard came about. So that's when it became Grand Wizard Theodore. You know, and um, the name just stuck with me. It was that you know, the rest was history. <laughs> uh, playing music differently is that that uh, you know you you, you talked to, like uh, DMC has been on the show and we right, you right, know, right. We've, we talked about just lyricism and coming up and 
you know, he said, you know, when they were coming out, it was like, you know, everyone was doing red, so you did blue, you know, mm-hmm. and you kind of, that was the significance of that. Yes, yes. Um, I imagine the same thing for DJing, is that if everyone's doing red, you're doing blue. Was that at first like a kind of an unspoken, you know, uh, un- unspoken that you were supposed to be able to, you know, you, you had to do something different to make yourself known? Um why, what did you do? Di- what did you feel you did differently than other DJs? Um, well, I sat back and watched all the other DJs, and I came to the realization that they all basically sound the same. You know, it's like um, you, you, it's like you get a recipe and, and give it to like five, five different chefs. It's like all the chefs are, are doing the same recipe. Right. But you might got that one chef that might start, you know, adding a little bit something more, you know. And, and me, myself, I said, if I'm going to be recognized as a DJ, I have to make sure that I don't sound like all the other DJs. So I watched all the other DJs. I've listened to all the other DJs and made sure that I thought outside the box and made sure that I sound like Grand Wizard Theodore and didn't sound like the other DJs. Because I truly believe that... Um, my gift, I have a gift, you know, um, as far as like, you know, turntablism is, is concerned. Um, everybody has a gift. And I realized early that my gift was being a DJ. And people definitely seen that when whenever I get on the turntables and start playing music. They'd be like, this, this, this guy's only like 11, 12 years old. And look at him here flipping the records back and forth like, you know, like it ain't nothing, you know. So... I definitely wanted to make sure that um, my style of DJing was was not like anybody else's style of DJing if I wanted to be known. So mm-hmm. that's basically what I did. If I seen a DJ play a record a certain way, I make sure I played it the opposite, mm-hmm. you know? And that's that's how I got noticed, you know? So, so of course, you know, Grandma is a theater inventor of the scratch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, how, did, how, how did the scratch come to be? Um, was it something you were, I mean, I, I think I was watching a documentary on the DJ and you just mentioned you're at a, a club, a party, and you kind of dropped the needle and it made a scratching sound and that kind of <laughs> how, I, I mean, I might be simplifying or, I'm, or I do. That's not how it um, um, When I was 12 years old in 1975, I was in my last year of junior high school and my principal played music in the lunchroom through the loudspeakers. I think he had a little boom box and he had the microphone that he does the announcements on. Oh, so wow. I guess he yeah. click click certain buttons where he can talk to either the whole building or just the or just the lunchroom. So he played music in the lunchroom and uh, a lot of the kids got tired of listening to the music that he was playing. So a friend of mine um convinced my principal to let me make a cassette tape. So the principal said, Okay, make a cassette tape. I'll listen to it and I'll see if if I can play it. So I went home, took my boombox, uh, put it in front of the speaker, press record, started making my cassette tape. And during the course of me making my cassette tape, um, the music that we practiced on was in my mother's house. Mm. So I was playing music so loud this day and it got to the point where my moms came and she... And she kicked the door open. She busted it. It seemed like she kicked the door open. <laughs> she came in the room and was like, look, either you cut the music down or you cut the music off. Now, those couple of seconds would seem like an eternity. I was actually making my cassette tape. One record was playing. It was ready to go off. And I was holding the other record. So what I did was I pulled the music down, did a little zooga zooga with the record, and played the record. My mom's left the room, and when I finished my cassette tape, I um, rewinded it back. And when it got to the part where she came in the room, I could hear myself baby scratching, and I was like, wow, I can incorporate this into all the other things that I do as a DJ. And as I practiced a couple of days, next couple of hours, and that's how I became a scratch. (laughs) So who was the first person or group of people that you kind of presented this the scratch too, and then what was, well, I guess, well, you know, it, it's so commonplace today, obviously, the scratch, but what was that reaction like? Well, we played, like I said earlier, we played music in the summertime. We gave block parties in the summertime. 
So this particular day when we gave our block party, that was my chance to uh, 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 present the scratch to everybody. You know, I like came to the park with like lightning in a, in a bottle and stuff <laughs> like that. And um, when people saw me scratching, man, it, it basically electrified the crowd. People were like, wow, what is this guy doing? It's like hearing your favorite record, but you hear me scratching the record. And everybody like, wow, what is this guy doing, you know? And it basically just electrified the crowd. And then ever since then, people were like, I mean, this guy's like really, really good. I mean, it's like as time goes by, he's getting better and better and better. I was like 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. And the older I got, the more my skills on the turntable got better and better and better. Did people go to you after this to kind of learn your technique on how to scratch? Was that a, was that immediate? Uh, or were well, people just trying themselves? Well, well people... I'm sure people went home. I'm sure some DJs went home and tried to learn, but not many people had two turntables in the mixer. Right. You know, um, back then a lot of people were MCs. They were B-boys. There was, there really wasn't that many DJs as it is now, you know, right. as time start to go by, that's when you start to see more MCs, more B-boys, um, more graffiti artists, more DJs, you know? And, um, my skills as a DJ was like two, three steps ahead of everybody because every day it was like my skills were getting better and better and better. And people see me come in the park and see me do something different every <laughs> every time we come to the park. And they'd be like, wow, this guy's skills is getting better and better. You know, you come to the park one week and he's doing one thing and then you come to the park the next week, he's doing something else, right. you know? So I was always two, three steps ahead of everybody. Uh, Talib Kweli and Mostaf's album, Black Star album, mm -hmm. uh, they have an intro, the intro track, and at the end it says, um, at the end of the intro track, it says, the statements they may, they will make, to, they, they, they make tonight will determine what everyone else plays shortly. Mm. Uh, with the scratch, what was the statement you think you were trying to make? Or was there like a statement that you were trying to make? The statement I was trying to make was that um, I want to change the way you listen to music, you know? by by creating the scratch. I want to change the way people listen to music. I want to change the way people look at the DJ. I wanted to basically make the the turntable my instrument, my musical instrument. I wanted the people to see how much talent I have and how I can create something from nothing. Mm. And that's exactly what I did. Obviously the scratch has developed and evolved in so many different ways since oh, you, you boy, invented yeah. yeah. Has there ever been, has there been a DJ that you've kind of watched or that's done the scratch that's kind of completely floored you and like, oh, shit, that's pretty, that's like, damn, that's good. Well, uh, now or, 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 or like back the, then? I, I guess the first time beside yourself, first, yeah, the first person you saw that tried the scratch that kind of like, oh, wow. Well, I will have to say um, a DJ's like um, WizKid, um, God bless him. Um, a DJ like um, a Master Don from mm -hmm. the Deaf Committee, and uh, these guys um, when when they jumped on the turntables and did what they did, man, they 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 definitely did take um take it to another level and stuff like that. And then you got a uh, Grand Mixer, you know, DXT and stuff like that when he did the Rocket and stuff like that, you know. And it was like um, I'm just happy that they 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 took something that I created and 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 and, and took it to the next level, you know. You talk about, you know, you go from the the equipment you had and, you know, obviously as time goes by, equipment develops and new technology and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, has How has the advancement of the tech, DJ equipment, has that helped and hurt or hurt mm -hmm. the idea of the scratch, but also, also the DJ? Well, it's like, um, it's like having a first car. You know, you look at the first car, that was made and then you look at the car now and these cars are driving themselves and <laughs> parking themselves and you know got computers in it and, and everything yeah. and you can talk to the car and everything so i think basically you know technology is is going to happen whether we like it or not we just have to change with it mm, yeah. you know if you if you see someone driving around in a 1945 car everybody gonna look at it like oh wow look at that you know then you see someone driving around in 2020 car they're gonna be like oh wow that's some new stuff so you know, technology is is gonna um, is gonna evolve whether we like it or not. We just have to make the decision whether we're gonna evolve with it. Mm. You know, and I've learned a long time ago that you know technology is coming out 
and I have to learn how to um to move with the technology, you know? Uh there's a you know, you, you ask people about you and kind of, you know, get info, you know, just like, hey, what would you ask? What would you ask, Grand Wizard Theodore? Um, <laughs> and, you know, the, my I, age, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a few, you know, a few friends who are, in, you know, hip hop graph writers, uh, B boys, and they, they told me about, they heard this story. It, was, it involves either you or Jazzy J about right. being at a, uh, a party and the shooting broke out. And either you or Jazzy J continued to play the record. Is that a true story? Yeah, that's, that has happened. That definitely has happened where <laughs> fight breaks out and we just keep playing music. You know, <laughs> that has happened. I mean, it has. I think it has happened to me like once or twice because if a fight breaks out in the party and it gets like really, really out of hand, you know, sometimes we uh, we depend on the, the, the security to, 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 to take care of it and stuff like that. But sometimes if the, if the, the fight gets out of hand and then it disrupts the whole entire party, then you have to cut the music down and trying to get everything under control. Has there been stories about you that you've kind of just like you heard and like those are completely untrue, you know, and, and, and if there has been, what, what was that story that kind of like you just need to like, mm. you know, cut, cut, dismiss real quickly, cut, cut it off? Well, there's, there's been stories where um, people say um, I, um, we gave a party, me and the L brothers, we gave a party and, um, I had a bunch of uh, silver chains on, and and I got stuck up, and they took all my silver chains off and stuff like that. You know, that, that's definitely not true. Um, it just basically been stories where people, you know, came inside the party and just stuck up the whole party and stuff like that. Which was that was which was true, but the part where they say that someone came in and took all the all the silver chains I had around my neck was um. One time in the 70s, everybody was wearing silver chains at, at one mm. time. Everybody was wearing silver chains. And I had a bunch of silver chains around my neck, and it was it was said that someone came and snatched all my, my chains off and stuff like that. But it wasn't really too many rumors that, that people were saying about me that that wasn't, that was that was true, you know. Uh, not many people might know that your your voice is sampled in one of, like, the most iconic songs that, you know, for me that I grew up with is uh, Public Enemies, Bring the Noise. Yeah. Uh, say, you know, turn it up. Yeah, um, yeah. What, what does that mean for you as, you know, you know, one of the pioneers who, like, to have his voice kind of sample, you know, a DJ having his own voice sampled by another crew. Um, and what it's, were you, um, go ahead. It's, it's, it's really cool. Um, I, I, I love, I, I love a uh, public enemy and stuff like that. And, um, I just feel, you know, like it's, it's surreal, man. I just, just feel really honored, man, that, 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 um, that they, um, you know, sample my voice. I'm just honored, you know. You obviously came from the time where, you know, the, the DJ was kind of the, the statue, the poster, the lead of the culture, and now the MC, you know, slowly, and now it has become really the, 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 the main focus, mm -hmm. I think, in the culture. Um, so when you first started, well, when was the first time for you that um, you saw the kind of the, I don't know, the MC taking over as the lead, and what were you, what are your first impressions of that? Well, the first time I seen that the MCs were basically being put in the forefront of the stage, and the and the DJ was put in the back is when when the records start to people started recording music and stuff like mm -hmm. that when. You know, when Sugar Hill Gang came out and then you had, uh, you know, Grandmaster Flash and them, they started recording and everything and stuff like that. And, um, you know, for marketing purposes, the MC, the MC was more marketable than the DJ. So they took the MC and put the MC in the front and they took the DJ and pushed the DJ to the back, you know. Then it got to the point where they said, well, we really don't need the DJ anymore. So they started using the dats and stuff like yeah, that. Right. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. They started using the dats and stuff and and it's just like um for marketing reasons, they just push the DJ to the back. Mm. Which is really crazy, you know? How, so um, it is what it is. <laughs> was there uh I mean I so I might if this was me and then I totally don't want to speak for you on this mm -hmm. one, but if this was me and I'm you know I'm 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 one of the pioneers of this uh 
I will, no matter what happens, no matter what group comes out, mm-hmm. and no matter, you know, no matter how good they are, I just want to, I would hate, you know, want to hate them because, you know, um, I don't know if that happened for you, but, but was there a, was there an MC that kind of, when, when this change started happening or a group that have, that came out mm-hmm. where you're like, okay, I get it. Like, all right, I understand what they're doing. Or, or I respect this person's art so much that I'm cool with them being the lead right now of the culture of the of the music um i never um never got to that point but when 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 grandmaster flash and the furious five when they when they when they recorded the album and they they start they had freedom they got they had freedom out and then they put out the message and stuff like that i was like cool you know this is this is opening a lot of doors for all the other you know, all the other MCs and all the other groups and stuff like that, you know? And by Flash and my brother Mean Gene being on the forefront of um of the innovation of of, of hip hop, I was like, you know, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, and you know, if 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 they in the forefront, it's all good. I just know that they are represented and they they've worked hard. I've seen them work so hard to get to where they were. Just like Myself and my brother Mean Gene, we've worked hard too to, to to get what we need to get to, you know. So it was like even if we would have been the first one, we would we would be there to open up doors for everybody else to come in behind us, you know. Then you had the Sugar Hill Gang, you know. The Sugar Hill Gang came out, and we was trying to figure out like, where did these guys come from? <laughs> you know, these guys were never doing no parties in the Bronx, and I never seen these guys and stuff like that, you know. I mean, we seen Big Bang Hank, God bless him. He was the manager for Grandmaster Cass and the Cold Cuts Brothers, you know? And um, I was like, what's going on here? You know, I'm a little bit confused. But, I mean, it's always going to be a curveball thrown when other people are are, are influencing stuff. And, and once the corporate corporate America got, got their hands on hip-hop, it was basically um, out of our hands. It was... Eventually, it was going to slip away from us once the corporate America got got their hands on hip hop, and that's when we started recording and we started putting out these albums and stuff like that. That's when our destiny was put into other hands. Mm. I feel I feel that way. You, 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 we talk now. We talk. Rap is number one genre of music out there. It's all over the world. You know, you you know you could mm-hmm. have now. You could have like like you mentioned, like you have Grandmaster Kaz recording himself in the Bronx while getting a beat from some dude in Australia, right? You know, yeah, like it's, yeah. it's, it's like that. Um, are you, I mean, I, I imagine, I mean, oh, are you happy to how big it's gone in? And, but, or more so, are you happy with how it became so big, the path that it, it, it took to get this big? Um, I'm not really too happy about the path that it's taken, um, I think that it's gotten to the point where all the pioneers, all the groups that put the blood, sweat, and tears into this art form, into this culture, should have gotten um, better recognition, um, should have been um, treated a little bit better because it got to the point where... Um, we were trying, they were trying to uh, um, um, erase us from history, mm-hmm. you know, um, trying to make it seem like uh, hip hop or rap started <laughs> in the 80s, you right, know, right. With, uh, with with Run DMC and, and, and all the groups that came out in the early 80s and stuff like that. I mean, I got love for all these groups and stuff like that, but it's definitely the media. The media should have been like, you know, there's a new, there's a new genre of music. It's called hip hop. It's called rap. You know, um, these are the guys that that it came from. You know, we just want to get recognized for 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 the blood, sweat, and tears that we put into this art form, into this culture. And I feel that there's a generation gap where we should have educated everybody. We should have documented a lot of stuff. We didn't do too much documentation. Um, we took a lot of pictures. But we should have done more documentation so that we could teach everybody around the world where this art form, where this culture came from. And then 
we wouldn't have to have these um, young rappers out here um, not respecting, you know, not respecting the uh, the the the, um, the people that put the blood, sweat, and tears and made the blueprint for something that um, that they're doing today. That's making them rich, millions and millions of dollars, and these corporate companies making them millions and millions of dollars, and they're just trying to just make us extinct. You know, we're still here. Right. We are still here. We ain't going nowhere. You know. Uh, I want to. You talk about uh, obviously with the lyrics. I understand lyrics. I you know people talk. I understand words. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, DJing is a whole different boy game, ball game because you know like you know, terminate. Speak with your hands. Um, <laughs> how how has the the purpose? And I should have asked you this in the beginning, but the purpose of or or the, the type of expression the DJs, what you started out doing, how has that changed to what it is today? Uh, I mean, are are DJs still trying to express themselves similar the same way? Uh, do you think there's like a, I don't know, I don't know, if it's commercial aspect of what they're doing, um, mm-hmm. like very similar? You know, like lyricism kind of has become pretty similar. It's, you know, commercially, it's the same song. It feels. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that the same with DJing? Um, yes and no. I feel that um, us as a DJ back in the days, I'm, 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 I can only speak for myself. When I get on the turntables, I want people to come to my parties and not forget about their problems, not forget about everything that's going on in their life, but I want them to be able to come to the party and just forget about everything that's going on in their life and just come to the party and just have a good time. You know, mm. um, doesn't matter what color you are, doesn't matter where you're from. Um, it's just one nation under a groove. Everybody just in the house partying and, and having a good time. You know, right. it doesn't matter who the DJ is. It doesn't matter what kind of skills the DJ have. It's just that the DJ is is doing a job and making sure that everybody's dancing and having a good time. Now you got people going to see DJs just because the DJ is a, you know, is a movie star or, or just a, a, a public figure and stuff like that. And I mean, that's all cool and everything, you know, but I feel that, you know, if you want to hire somebody, hire me, hire Grand right. Wizard Theodore, you know? <laughs> right. And, um, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to hire a celebrity DJ, I mean, hire Hire a pioneer DJ to be along with the celebrity DJ mm. or something like that, you know? And um, I just feel that um, people should just realize that when you go to a party, the DJ has one job to do, and that's to make everybody dance and have a good time. You don't want anybody standing in front of the stage just looking at the DJ because you've seen him on TV or seen him somewhere, you know? Right. Hire a DJ because of his skills, right. you know? How speaking of a live show, how do you how does your live show how is the live show work out for you? I mean, is it is it because it looks flawless, right? So is it planned out or is it really mm-hmm. based on maybe the feel of the crowd or the feel or even the feel what you're feeling that you know you you could have totally planned one set and then get there and like oh, uh, yeah yeah know, throw it out the window whatever yeah it never um it never works out the way you plan um like when I go. Like if, if someone say, okay, we want you to come to Australia, we want you to do like five shows. When I get to the venue, I don't know who's there. Right. I have to look at the crowd and figure, oh, wow, okay, let me play some 80s music. You know, they might not want to hear 80s music. They might want to hear some reggae. If I play some reggae, they might not want to hear reggae. They might want to hear some turntable stuff. Or they just might want to hear some, some funk and soul music. Or they might want to hear me just play some 45s. I really don't know until I actually get to the venue. And I really like that challenge because it 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 it, it just um, helps me and and to uh, to stay focused on what I need to do as a DJ. So you know? are you still lugging crates? Well, what I do is I play a computer, but what I do is I put like a little small um, um, crate of records in my bag and stuff like oh, that. Nice. I might put like a little, you know, a couple of records in my bag that where I can close my laptop and just get you know just get busy with the vinyl and stuff like that. So that people can see the difference between, you know, playing a laptop and then playing vinyl. Right. You know? uh, speaking of what's what what is that one sound that you get from a vinyl that you can't get 
from a laptop. Mm. That um, that hard bassy sound that that really really moves you, man. I mean, it takes you back to listening to the jukebox, mm-hmm. going to a club and sticking a quarter into the jukebox and hearing that heavy hard sound when the record comes on, you know, right. or um, just uh, or going or, or just being in in your parents' house and playing that 45 and hearing that hard that hard knock studio sound from the record and getting that that feeling that's what that's what it is mm. you know what's your favorite maybe a couple of favorite pieces of music to, that you definitely have to play when you're or even not even to just play for the crowd just play for yourself to kind of like just get you in it would have to be funk and soul music man I mean like if I if I do a DJ set, I would have to play some Aretha Franklin, Rock Study. I would have to play some some James Brown, you know. Oh, yeah, nice. And some Dennis Coffee. Dennis Coffee is like um, a jazz band, and we used to play Dennis Coffee breaks. Some of his songs actually had breaks in them. And then you got the um, Incredible Bongo Band, you know, and, and stuff like that. And then you got the the Cool in the Gang, and then you got all these funk and soul groups that has breaks in their records and those are the songs that i like to i like to play man i love it mm-hmm. so speaking of the live show you know with the the last night of dj saved my life mm-hmm. um yes you have that going going on uh how did that how did how did that come about i mean you, you look at the lineup and you're like <laughs> how do you get all those people together <laughs> well you know you know lbc you know from um from um uh, from baltimore um you know, she she brought the idea to my attention, and um, I think it's you know really cool to bring a DJ back. I mean, come to a venue and listen to these pioneer DJs. You know, you got you got one DJ that's that's like um, you know, Public Enemy's um 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 producer, Keep Chakra, yeah, yeah. Then you got one DJ, Cut Creator, which is used to be LL Cool J's uh, right. a DJ. And then you got DJ Hurricane, which was used to be the BC Boys DJ. You know. Then you got um, Charlie Chase. They used to play for the Cold Cuts Brothers, right. you know. Then you got Grand Wizard Theodore, the creator of Scratch and the Needle Drop, you know. And to have all of us like collectively bands is this it's awesome, man. You know. Does that mean there would be? Are you all on stage at once, or is it just kind of different sets? Yeah, different sets. Different yeah, sets. yeah, different sets. Um, there ain't come a time where. You have one DJ coming and do an hour, the next DJ coming and do an hour, next DJ coming and do an hour. And people can see that we all have different styles, mm-hmm. you know? So it's like you come in and it's like, we got five DJs and all these guys got different styles. So it's like you can come and just party all night with these guys, you know? One guy might play house music, one guy might play funk and soul, one may play R&B, one may play reggae, all of them got different styles. And we can cover like a whole party. You know, you, you mentioned you mentioned everyone that's going to be there, uh, and I kind of wanted to do a quick like word association. Like you know, <laughs> I say their names, you say first thing that comes up. Uh, mm-hmm. So Keith Keith Shockley. Oh, Keith Shockley, come on! I mean, Keith is like uh, uh, so much energy, man. You never know what Keith is going to play because every time I go see Keith play, he may do house music or he may just do breaks. Um, you know, by him being, um, you know, one of the uh, 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 producers of the Public Enemy, it's like you never know what this guy's gonna play, and I and I love that about him. He's unpredictable. Mm-hmm. Hurricane, Hurricane, oh man, Hurricane, man, just um, so aggressive, man. It's like um, when he when he plays, man, it's just like you can feel you can feel his energy, man, and you can feel the. Um, the essence of where he came from, mm. you know, and it's like the the electricity this guy sends is is this incredible, incredible. Charlie Chase, Charlie Chase, wow. Well, Charlie Chase is from like the same um, um 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 true school that I'm from, so I know that whatever he does, man, he's gonna put his heart into it, and his soul, and his energy into it because this is what we was doing before we even started making any money from doing this. You know, we we love this culture. We live this culture, and it shows when we actually perform. Cut creator. Cut creator. Oh man, being LL Cool's D, being L, being LL Cool J's DJ, um, 
he's used to you know playing the big arenas um he wants people to 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 realize that he's still here he hasn't gone nowhere um he loves music just like we love it and you will never know what he's going to do you don't know if he's going to play house he's going to play reggae you don't never know what he's going to do and his energy is, is is really good man he's a really he's really good people you know and, and last but not least uh grand wizard theater oh man um i know about that guy <laughs> i'm just gonna just like come and bring a a a, 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 a to com complete the energy of everybody man i'm gonna come in and just i want to electrify the crowd you know i want them to to see the uh different um different faces of grand wizard theater where I might come in and do my laptop for ten for half an hour and then the the, the last half an hour come out and do my turntable and stuff mm. with my forty fives and my break beats and stuff like that to to show people how rounded I am and to show them that I have a gift and I'm gonna display this gift to you. So just sit back, strap yourself in and I'm gonna take you for a ride. You're not just a DJ. Mm -hmm. You you're not just a teacher. Uh you're not just a pioneer. You do obviously other stuff, mm -hmm. um, and as we were talking before, you you mentioned before the interview uh, your clothing line. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that? Well, the clothing line is called um, the Birth of Hip Hop. You can go to birthofhiphop.com. dot com, and um, it's a clothing line. You know, and it's it's a clothing line that not only you can wear, but you can learn from the clothing line by going to the by going to the website and stuff like that. Um, I feel that you know it's a lot of different. Um, um, clothing lines out but you know why not wear your own clothing line <laughs> right, you know definitely. yeah yeah so you know the birth of hip-hop is just a clothing line to remind people man that that i'm a part of something that basically changed the world mm. you know and we have we have we have tees for girls we have hoodies we have all the apparel and when you walk the streets and people look at it it it, it sends a message the birth of hip-hop the birth of something that Changed the world. When did you? When did that idea come to you? I mean, when did you? Well, the idea came to me um, a couple of years ago with uh, myself and um, uh, Mr. Uh, Cortez McKay. Um, we are um, um, in the process of filming um, "Itching for a Scratch," which is a, a, um, a, a, a three-part series on how I created the scratch. We have a little uh, eleven-year-old kid playing me and stuff like that, and, and we're filming now and stuff like that and we just hope that you know we can present it to the world and they can see um a perspective on you know what kind of kid i was before i created the scratch you know because i think it's very important for people to know how we lived in the city like i said earlier the abandoned buildings right. the single parent homes um the gangs um the drugs everything was 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 smothering us in the um in the Bronx in the early seventies and this is what became of it. You know? This is what became of it. You know? Oh, that's amazing. Yes. Uh, yes. Legend, inventor, teacher, pioneer, mm -hmm. uh everything. Uh Grand Wizard Theater, thank you so much for joining me in the library, man. Salute. Thank you. <laughs>